Hey, ambitious dentist, welcome to Start Your Dental Practice, the show for existing and aspiring dentists to take your dental practice to the highest possible level. I'm your host, Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV, founder of DentistMetrics.com. In every episode, we aim to demystify the how to start a dental practice problem by bringing on world-class dentists, influencers, and consultants in the dental industry to pick their brain about how to get past the barriers involved from going from no practice to being a practice owner to owning your own successful dental practice. Hey guys, so in today's episode, it's going to be a self-hosted podcast today. Uh, The topic of today's discussion is going to be accounting in your dental practice, how that function works, what the heck is it, uh, as well as how to pick out an accounting software that will work for your dental practice. I'll give my suggestions. I'll also fill you in on how things used to be done versus how they can be done now so that you can be better prepared for whenever you make that decision. So in order for me to kind of explain the software and the accounting function and all that, we kind of kind of break it down into a bit more of a uh, broad definition and then we'll work our way in from there. So accounting defined, like the definition of accounting, I looked up, there's a bunch of definitions for it. Uh, The one that I liked the best was the American Accounting Association's definition, which is, it is the process of identifying, measuring, and communicating economic information to permit informed judgments and decisions by users of the information. So notice that's not just talking about, you know, reconciling a bank statement. It's saying that accounting is literally the process of being able to disseminate this data that these these, uh, transactions that occur within your practice and being able to measure it, communicate that economic information that allows you to perform informed judgments as a user of that information. Now, that is an area that is very is, is missed in a lot of accounting functions and it's really the definition of it. So, you know, we we polled our, our clients and we saw that around 90% of those clients who had had a CPA prior to coming on to us had never had a discussion about what their financials actually meant, like how how they could use those be able to have informed judgments and decisions, be able to make better business decisions. So 90% of the clients that we brought in said that they'd never had anything explained to them about what those financials actually meant. So they were just getting a copy of them and then they were you know, filing them away. And that was that. At the end of the year, they paid taxes with it. That's not what we're doing here. We're trying to explain in the accounting function how to create uh, some type of economic information that is going to permit you to make an informed judgment. So if the ultimate goal is to create a report or some type of economic information that can allow you to have an informed judgment, uh, then you've got to, let's break that into little smaller pieces. So inside of the accounting function in a dental practice, in my mind, there's really four kind of main areas that get put into that. So there is the collections, which is the receiving of money from patients for services rendered. Uh, it's the, the way that we deposit it, and it's also the way we record it. So it's the receiving of that money, it is the depositing of that money, and the recording of that money. So all of these different areas we're talking about here are processes. These are things that occur uh, that people actually have to do in some manner in order to be able to make this information be put into the accounting system. So we've got to receive the money from the patient, we've got to deposit it somehow, whether it be through you know, a credit card machine or taking money to the bank. And then we've got to record it in some way into the accounting system. The next would be receivables. So the, both the patient and the insurance side of that, it's the, whenever, you know, the the patient comes in, they make their payment and then that's part of the collections. And then the receivables is actually recording those receivables and then sending out invoices or statements for those receivables to be sent back to us and remitted for payment. And so at that point, it becomes the receivables actually has a, a piece of the collections component in it whenever they actually have paid for that for that service. The next area is payables. So that's the payments, the actual issuing of payments, as well as the recording of those payments, whether that be a payment from a check, whether that be a payment from a loan, whether that be a payment from a credit card uh, or a from an outside account as, a, as, a, as, a, as an owner contribution of some sort. It is the payment of 
supplies, payments of labs, payment of everything uh, for any type of uh, expense occurring in that business and the recording of that expense, how we do that. And lastly, uh, you know, payroll is obviously a piece of the puzzle, recording of that payroll, and then actually being able to have that separated in a way that you can actually analyze what, what it is you're looking at. So that's the logging and the actual physical payment of that payroll. So how we actually pay our employees, whether it be through direct deposit, whether it's where we are writing checks, everything like that. And a quick note about like human resources, which is I get a lot of questions about human resources. Uh, if, if they need to pay some outsourced company, you know, two, three hundred dollars a month for, for HR services in a small dental practice that's got eight, eight employees or something like that. I don't personally think that's a that's something that you have to worry about. Uh, you think, you know, you want to check with an attorney in your state that is familiar with uh, uh, employment law as to what your responsibilities are as an owner in terms of human resources. And really, to me, that's all I would do um, if they say yes. You've got to do these compliance things. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to do this. You need to do that. And it's worth two to three hundred dollars a month for you not to have to worry about it. At that point, maybe do it. But before then, don't. No. So sorry, that's a little aside. Those are the four areas that I, that I think have processes that kind of, if you add all those processes together, it equals your accounting system. So collections, receivables, payables, and payroll. Now, obviously, there is things like cash flow management. There are things like you know if we're equipment financing, how we're going to have debt services and things like that. That's a little bit more advanced. And that is typically a piece of the puzzle that you're using this economic information to help you decide if you're going to do those things. So that's the reason I didn't really include that in the kind of the crux of the accounting system, if you will. So all of these little processes, the collections, receivables, payables, and payroll, they all have to be recorded in some way. And so the, the main part of this uh, podcast is going to be covering the softwares that are out there and how to choose the right one for your dental practice. We find that there's a lot of people that have confusion in this area. Uh, sometimes they just kind of go with whatever the accountant says. And so we're gonna kind of explain the historical way whenever I started in this industry, how most accounting syst systems were set up with dental practices, as well as what we see going on right now uh, and how we like to do it. For the accounting system and the accounting process that historically what we saw uh, practices doing. So whenever I started about 10 years ago, this is how it was done. And just as a caveat, I started in a really, really large firm, the largest firm in our state at the time. And this is somewhat of the way that this was done back then. I then moved to a firm that was a, like a paper and pencil firm where we had, I had experience with um, Peachtree, QuickBooks, Quicken, Great Plains, Sage, Mass90, uh, and of, of course QuickBooks, uh, if I didn't say that one. So I, I've had experience with every type of accounting software and I've also had experience with doing it by, by ledger sheets, like big, big, fold out ledger sheets that you guys can only dream of right now. But I'm talking about like a probably a four foot wide book that you flip open and there's these big giant ledger sheets that come out and you've got to use those as the accounting systems. So I've, I've, I've had experience with, with the paper and pencil version. I've had experience with doing it with your own Excel spreadsheets as well as using all these, you know, legacy desktop softwares. Whenever we were first started, the way that it was typically done um, with this with the smaller firm with our small businesses is that the small business would send us a copy of the bank statement and we would enter in to our accounting software every transaction that occurred on that bank statement so every expense we would go in and literally in our accounting system we would recreate what happened over the month so we'd have to go in and if there was 50 checks we'd have to create 50 checks in the accounting system that would map and then we'd have to enter in who it was paid to, how much it was paid for, and the date of the check. We would also then go in and we'd, we'd, we'd go off of the checkbook for that one. Um, we'd then go to the bank statement and say, okay, these checks cleared, these checks didn't. Uh, we'd then also look at the ledger and see if there was any deposits that were made that the, uh, the, the bookkeeper or the own business owner, typically it was a business owner, would record in their little ledger sheet. We'd then see if those cleared the bank, and then that would be that would be reconciling it. We then do that with credit cards, and we do it with all these other things. So 
there's a lot of back and forth there. So what happens after we finish with that those transa- recording those transactions in that in the CPA firm's accounting system is that we'd, we'd create a, an accounting report. If the client had an accounting report they'd generated internally, we'd then send them adjusting entries for them to be able to enter. You know, time and time again, what would happen is that when we sent those adjusting entries, the client would uh, either not have time to do the adjusting entries, they didn't understand the, the journal entries, uh, or they just didn't, you know, they, they didn't want to, to worry about that. And sometimes they didn't even have an accounting system set up internally in the practice. They just relied completely on us to do the work other than them having like a little ledger sheet or a checkbook or something like that. So there's a lot of inefficiencies in that process. There's inefficiencies on the accounting practices side because you're having to charge for that time uh, of going in and recreating literally everything that's occurred in that statement. And then looking at the, you have to go through the bank statement and every transaction that was entered into the checkbook, we'd have to mark off. And then if there was anything that was on the bank statement that hadn't been entered into the checkbook, we had to find that. And then we had to figure out if that was a, a justified purchase and then record it. And it's just, it's just a big headache, to be honest with you. So that's kind of the legacy way of, of doing things. It's kind of the old way. Uh, now, that's, that's not the oldest way. Like I said before, I've done it in other ways that are, that are uh, you know, even older. But that is the kind of like, I guess, the, the, ni- the mid-90s to the ends of the 2010s way of doing it. It's, I guess, a way for me to be able to say that. Lots of issues with timeliness on that. Just talked to somebody the other day. They, uh, ha- they, what they would do is instead of you know, just sending bank statements and things like that, they would send a copy of, and this is kind of the next step of the, the next thing we saw people doing, is that they would send us copies of their files of their, or their accounting records of software, and we'd import it into our accounting software, and then we'd go in and we'd fix everything. And then we'd send the copy back to them, and they would go and do some work. Now... Um, QuickBooks does have a thing called an accountant's copy, but what that does is it freezes a, a time frame. It's really, you know, for a lot of clients, it was really confusing of how to set that up correctly to how to be able to be sent to the uh, accountant and then the accountant be able to send it back in a timely manner. I just talked to somebody yesterday who was using a, a firm that, you know, specialized in dentistry and they said they sent out their QuickBooks file on January the 6th. For this for the 2015 year, and they had to be put on hold of doing their accounting reporting up until April the 14th. So it took them three and a half months to get the, their QuickBooks file back to them, and so that person was in limbo for three and a half months on their accounting system. So, and you know, now, now granted that if that was an accountant's copy, it could have been potentially fixed. But at the same time, it's still pretty inefficient to be sending a copy of a, of, a, of a file back and forth and then, you know, relying on the software to do the rest for you. That's kind of the, 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 the little bit newer way of doing it. The way that we prefer to do it is through online accounting systems, through cloud accounting systems. It allows a client to access their accounting reports from anywhere they need to, anywhere there's an internet-based uh, internet uh uh, you know, internet computer or even on your phones, you can go in and you can look at your stuff and you can be working on it at the same time. We can access your stuff in real time. So rather than you having to send us a bank statement, we can go in and actually hook up the accounting software to your bank and pull out the data from the bank so that we have a live feed that we can go in. And we have some clients that will go in a couple times a week and we'll clear their bank feeds and, and reconcile their items for them. So that's the new way. It's called cloud accounting because it's accessed on the internet, on the cloud, and it's very easy for, it's very efficient for the client as well as the CPA. So that is what kind of the, the, the last, what the last 15 to 20 years have looked like for accounting systems for small businesses with CPAs. So how do you decide what you're going to do? Well, I'm obviously biased, uh, so I'll try to say this without coming saying do what I do or or say or do what I say to do. Um, But to me, what you need to be doing for your accounting system is working efficiently with your CPA. So 
for example, if you're working with me as one of my clients, you're going to be on a cloud accounting system. Um, we've had people with desktop software that they've came on and they said they wanted a, us, for us to be their CPAs and they didn't want to switch away from the desktop version. You know, honestly, we, we end up, you know, saying that that's not going to be a good fit because that's not efficient for how our practice is ran. But that doesn't mean that there's other CPAs out there that are a little bit more lenient. I don't want to say that I'm, I'm, I'm a snob or anything like that. It's just that for my business system, my business's uh, setup, that just doesn't work for us because it's just not efficient. And we don't like having to do things that don't go into our, our systems. Now, are we always going to be that way? No, potentially not. Um, we like to do what we find is efficient for the client as well as efficient for us. And the, the legacy versions of, you know, the, the, the desktop versions, uh, we just don't find them being optimal for, for, some, for, some, for, for most of our clients. So that does not mean it's not optimal for your CPA and it does not mean it's not optimal for your practice. Uh, it just depends on, on, on the ways that you use your software. That might sound, you know, talking through that, that kind of sounds like it may be a, a little bit of a cop out to say, you need to do what your CPA does. Uh, because I'm a firm believer that your CPA needs to be someone that is very closely in line with your business. Someone is a, an arm of your business, if you will. Uh, so they are a spoke in the wheel of your business systems, if, if you want to kind of take that analogy further. So you need that relationship and that communication to be as seamless as possible so that they can do their job well and so that they can give you the reports that can give you an informed decision to be able to do everything uh, the, the same way. So now that is a two-way street. It's, there's communication. Every time there's communication, there's two, there's two facets of that. For us, again, the reason we do the online one is because that's easier for us to be able to make sure that we have things done in a timely manner, as well as be able to let people be, to communicate with our clients these reports that allow them to have informed decisions. If your, you know, your, your CPA does it in, with the desktop versions, that's fine, that as long as they can give you those informed decisions. Because again, that's the definition of accounting. As f going back to the, the discussion about how it's a two-way two street, you as a business owner need to be making sure that you are uh, setting things up on your side to where you can actually record these things efficiently to be able to make sure that there is no ambiguity of what's going on from a, a data perspective. That is the reason we like the online softwares is because it's easy to access. You don't have to worry about you know software versions or compatibility issues with Windows updates or you've got a Mac and we've got a PC or you don't have to worry about you know, all these different things that happen whenever you're talking about using an actual software. So another reason that I'm not a huge fan of the desktop versions of these softwares is because the desktop version of the softwares are built as kind of enterprise systems. They're fantastic for small businesses, but they're fantastic for every small business. So there's a million little modules that are built in there that only serve as noise, really. Um, they serve as extra functions and extra things that allow the clients to get kind of lost in the, 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 the flow of the accounting system. I find the online versions are stripped down a bit more. And so if they're stripped down a bit more, there's not as many areas for you know, mistakes, to be honest with you, to be made. That is another reason we like the online version. Um, and it's also easier to segment responsibilities in those online versions than on the desktop versions. So for example, you can have an employee that has access to the accounting system and they only have access to be able to enter deposits or they only have access to enter in checks and, and, and payments or bills, if you will. You can have, have your accountant have the ability to do everything and then have the business owner or you know maybe a, a, a financial advisor of some sort, that if it's not their CPA, can have access to just the reports if they need to. They're very, very flexible because they're, so, they're, they're online based rather than software based, which you can do all those things in the software, but it's much more difficult to set up correctly, I've found. I've seen many, 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 many more messed up softwares uh, than I have online solutions. So one important piece of this, th this puzzle also is that the cost 
for the desktop versions, is, or the, the desktop software is typically less uh, of a cost on a yearly basis compared to, say, an online software. But the I definitely feel like the you, you gain so much more efficiency from the online versions that it's really worth it. Uh, and if you have a, a, a CPA that has, utilizes those online softwares, they typically can get you a pretty good discount as well. So the cost is, is, is a factor for some people, but I think the efficiencies gained is, is much, much higher. So if we're going to start talking about the, you know, the actual softwares that are out there, um, I have experience with, with QuickBooks Online, with Xero, with Wave, uh, with a few other of the online ones. Um, and for, for what we like to use, again, I am biased of this, uh, is that we, we prefer Xero, X-E-R-O as our accounting software for our dental practices, we find a comparison I make for a lot of people is that Xero is kind of like the Mac version. Like if you've ever used a Macintosh or like an iPhone, the, the Macintosh only has certain things you can do, uh, it, but it, it allows you to do a lot, but it ha you have to do it in a certain way. So it was designed with the user in mind of being able to only do certain things. The like, QuickBooks Online is the, other, is, is the biggest one. Um, I find that QuickBooks Online is kind of like a, a Windows experience where you can do a lot of stuff in it, but since you can do a lot of stuff, you can, you can bog it down with errors. Uh, so, and, it, and it's harder to define those errors. So again, I'm biased because we use Xero for almost all of our practices uh, and we find that it allows us to deliver our accounting reports very, very quickly and very efficiently. Um, for our clients, we attempt to get our accounting reports out within 10 business days of the month close. So if the month closes on a Friday, we try to have our accounting reports out by two Fridays later. And we typically hit that, uh, assuming that there's not an issue with some, getting some information from the client. Um, we find, you know, we have a, a few clients that were on QuickBooks Online whenever they came to us and they didn't want to change. Uh, we've had a few that were on QuickBooks Online and they changed over to zero and they loved the change, so they were happy with that. But we definitely prefer zero. Uh, even as someone who is, you know, accounting professional, um, again, this is me being completely biased. I know there's people out there that think otherwise. Um, that QuickBooks Online is hard to navigate uh, and it's it's also it's kind of it's kind of clunky to me. I mean, I. I've, I've, I've been using computers since I was five. <laughs> I mean, I was, I've been using computers my entire life. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty savvy with software and digital technologies and navigation. And to me, QuickBooks Online just is not very intuitive. Uh, and if I can't get through it, then I just don't expect my clients to be able to get through it either, which means that, 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 that turns me away from it. Uh, however, it is definitely the biggest accounting software out there that's online, and there's a lot of people that really, really like it, and they use it efficiently and effectively. So if if your CPA is using QuickBooks Online, that is that's not that that's probably just the one that they're more familiar with. And if they're more familiar with it, then they can probably teach you what you need to know, or at least they should be teaching you what you need to know, and as well as your staff of how to do things in the way that works to make sure that they can get the relevant accounting information and the financial information to you so that you can make, again, informed judgments based off of the data that is collected. So uh, that, that, is a, that is a recommendation of Xero, X-E-R-O. Uh, we find that we've had, you know, 65-year-old office managers that have never used software before that can use Xero effectively because it's so, it's so, it, it's a simple software to use. And there's an old saying that complexity is the enemy of execution. Uh, and we definitely found that, that for us, that, that, that's the case for uh, uh, QuickBooks Online. Again, that's not, that's not going to be the same for everybody. Definitely give Zero a shot. However, if your CPA is not familiar with it, you're probably going to be bogging him down. Uh, and that may affect that communication, that two-way street. So if they're more familiar with something like QuickBooks Online or QuickBooks Desktop, then that might be a better solution for them as well as you. 
So to be completely honest, I'm not absolutely certain how this podcast is going to turn out uh, because it's all about accounting systems and softwares and things like that. It's kind of technical. Uh, it's not you know about building a giant practice and you know living this life of abundance and and you know generate you know building a great business. But guys, I want you to stress accounting is a part of that. It's it's the recording of what it is that you're doing. Uh, so I, I hope that you've you've gained some information out of this. Um, I've given you a few suggestions. We talked about what you know the accounting system actually is. You guys don't be you know. So we have so many docs that come to us and they just say I don't have any idea what accounting is. I've never had to worry about it and I never want to worry about it. And we definitely see that from the older generations um, of the you know the 50 plus demographic of dentists that they've never had to worry about it, so they don't worry about it, or they've done it in a certain way for so long that they don't want they don't want to do anything differently uh, and they've been doing it in a way that they've been able to just get it done rather than being able to use that information for any type of decisions again this is a piece of the the, the puzzle to stepping into the reporting of the uh, of the information that is going to allow you to have an informed judgment you guys didn't get accounting degrees you don't have the, you know, you're not going to be able to issue a compilation based off of the, you know, the income tax basis of accounting as, as defined by the, you know, the, the AICPA or is any, you know, any other accounting function or, or, or entity. This purpose of this episode was kind of just to inform you of what you need to be looking for uh, as well as kind of giving you the outline of what an accounting system actually is. It's not just some report you get every once in a while and that you should file away. It's a, it's a whole system that allows you to track your numbers more effectively so that you can make better informed decisions for your business, which ultimately will affect your income and affect your business greatly. Hey guys, so today's bonus is our internal chart of accounts that we use for dental practices. Now, we adjust this and change it a little bit for each practice that comes on to be able to mold it towards what that practice needs. However, this is the chart of accounts that we start out with with all of our accounting clients. So, that is, you know, if you don't know what a chart of accounts is, basically your accounting system is set up of these accounts, that these little, these little tags that we put towards the transactions that occur. This chart of accounts is the one that we use for all of our dental clients. So, or at least we use this starting point. So this is really valuable. It should save you a ton of time. It's in an Excel format so that you can just import it straight into your accounting software. You may need a little bit to do a little bit of, of, of adjusting, but it should be a really great resource so that you can skip a lot of the, the, the brain power you gotta use to put into these things. So if you want a copy of that chart of accounts, the same one that we use in our you know, high-end accounting services, then just text the word practice to 33444. Again, that's practice to 33444, and you will get that straight to your inbox. So that's it for today's episode, but that doesn't mean that the learning and implementation have to stop there. I've created a free report called the 15 numbers that will make or break your dental practice. This report has been downloaded over a thousand times by dental professionals. So if you want your free copy of this report that's going to outline what the most important numbers are in any dental practice, and it also includes how to look at your numbers, how to set goals, has a whole slew of really important information that is the culmination of all of my experience as a dental, dental CPA, then just go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash free gift. That is start your dental practice.com slash free gift. And so that's it for today, Ambitious Dentist. Again, I'm Jonathan Van Horn, CPA and ABV. I'll see you next week with another world-class practice owner or consultant that will help you start your very own dental practice. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Start Your Dental Practice community. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do me a favor and go to startyourdentalpractice.com slash iTunes to leave your honest feedback and review on iTunes. It's going to help me create a better experience, a better show, a better podcast 
for you, the ambitious dentist. Your feedback really does help. Regardless if you like the show today or not, if you didn't like the show, let me know because it's going to help me create a better show and podcast for you. Lastly, if you know of anybody that would benefit from today's episode and today's content, today's guest, please feel free to share with them on social media or through email. 